All right, welcome to the January webinar of the NASA Night Sky Network. This month, we welcome Rick Feinberg to our webinar, who will share with us some of the latest discoveries as announced at the winter meeting of the, of the American Astronomical Society. Rick Feinberg is in his 10th year as press officer of the American Astronomical Society from 1986 to 2008. He served in a variety of editorial and management positions at Sky and Telescope Magazine, including eight years as editor-in-chief. He earned his bachelor's degree in physics at Rice University and his master's and doctorate in astronomy at Harvard University. Though trained as a professional astronomer, Rick remains an amateur at heart, observing the sky and taking astrophotos from his private observatory in central New Hampshire. In inveterate travel, often in pursuit of total solar eclipses, Rick has visited all seven continents and the North and South Poles. So please welcome Rick Feinberg. Thank you very much, Brian, Vivian, Dave. I appreciate the opportunity to be here with everybody this evening. Um, I'm going to share my screen, so give me just a second. And with any luck, you'll be able to see my PowerPoint slides. All right, well, hopefully. It looks great. You can see my slides, great, that's good to know. Okay, so um, I'm fresh back from Seattle, Washington. Uh, every January, the American Astronomical Society has the bigger of its two annual meetings. We have a smaller meeting in the summertime, uh, but the winter meeting is big. And my predecessor, Steve Marin, who was AAS press officer for uh, almost a quarter of a century, uh, he coined the term Super Bowl of Astronomy to describe our winter meeting. Now in those days, the Super Bowl was actually played in January, but now with, uh, uh, with the football schedule having been extended a bit, the Super Bowl uh, has, uh, ooched its way into early February. So um, I hope you'll give us a little artistic license to continue to call our January meeting the Super Bowl of astronomy. Uh, we call it that because it's uh, generally the biggest astronomy meeting of the entire year uh, worldwide. The only meeting uh, of professional astronomers that ever uh, exceeds a winter AAS meeting is the International Astronomical Union General Assembly which involves astronomers from the entire planet. Uh, that occurs only every three years. So most years, we are by far the biggest astronomy meeting of the year. And the AAS itself, as I've kind of intimated, is the professional society of astronomers. Um, it's mostly US, though we also have a fair number of Canadian members. We have some Mexican members uh, and several hundred international members as well. Uh, so it's not just North America. All right, so let me tell you a little bit about uh, what the meeting entails. Um, I'm not just going to tell you some science highlights. I'm going to give you a little flavor of the meeting. Um, let's see if I can advance my slides. That, there we go. Okay. Um, so it's a big meeting, as you can see. This is a photograph from a plenary session uh, where most of the, in this case, 3,200 attendees. Uh, come together and hear uh, presentations from uh, prominent speakers. Uh, sometimes they're prize winners, sometimes they're just people who have done especially fascinating and interesting research. Uh, if you've been keeping up with the news, you'll recognize that the photo in the background there on the slide is uh, Oumuamua, the interstellar visitor. I'll say a little bit more about that later. So people uh, come in and they get badged up and then they uh, can spend uh, the next four days attending the meeting. Uh, it's more than just science, it's, um, it's social events too. It's an opportunity for people to uh, get together with old friends, to make new friends, uh, to meet with colleagues. Um, as you can see at this table, at, at one of the receptions, uh, we get a lot, a lot of young people. Uh, our winter meeting is uh, very strongly represented by students. Uh, we have hundreds of undergraduates, hundreds of graduate students at the meeting. Um, most people who are getting their PhD during the current year will give a thesis presentation at the January meeting. We have uh, upwards of 100 of those each year. Um, so it's uh, quite dynamic. There's an event where undergraduates can come learn about graduate programs in astronomy, uh, which is always very popular. 
uh, because most astronomers, of course, are eager to uh, go all the way through to a PhD, a doctorate. Um, and so one of the main reasons the undergraduates like to come to the meeting uh, is not just to present whatever research they might have done, but also a chance to meet with representatives from all the graduate programs. And almost every graduate program in North America is represented at this uh, event that we have the night before the meeting gets uh, officially underway with science talks. We have workshops, uh, professional development, skill building. Here's a workshop where people are learning to uh, access scientific databases online and do visualizations with the worldwide telescope uh, data system. It's a kind of a high powered desktop planetarium that not only shows you what the sky looks like, but gives you access to the underlying data uh, from spacecraft, ground-based observatories, and so on. So lots of workshops occur on the weekend before the meeting begins. We also have uh, policy discussions. So for example, you may have heard that astronomers are gearing up for the decadal survey. This is an exercise that is uh, sponsored by the National Academies of Science. And we, uh, we, the community comes together and discusses, you know, what are the biggest scientific questions for the coming decade and what ground-based and space-based instrumentation do we need, new telescopes, new space missions, et cetera, to be able to answer these questions or at least make significant progress in them. So uh, the upcoming decadal survey is called Astro 2020. Uh, the two chairs are in the lower right photograph, uh, Fiona Harrison from Caltech, uh, and I'm blanking on his name. Oh, no, it's uh, Robert Kennecutt. Um, I think he's from uh, University of Wisconsin and also Texas A&M. Uh, they're the co-chairs of the survey. They were just named by the National Academies a couple of weeks ago. Um, and so they came to the meeting to uh, give everybody a preview of how the process is going to work. We get all sorts of famous people at our meetings. Uh, you guys probably don't recognize this famous person, but if you're an astronomer, you know that it's David Silva who runs the National Optical Astronomy Observatory. I wonder if more of you will recognize this famous person. Um, since I can't hear you all, um, I don't know how many of you are chatting at the moment and saying, oh, I know who that is. But that's Apollo 17 moonwalker Jack Schmidt, uh, who's on a NASA advisory panel. Uh, that, um, now, he's not a NASA employee anymore, uh, if he had been, he probably wouldn't have come to the meeting because of the shutdown. Uh, but because he's not, he was able to come uh, and solicit feedback on various NASA programs because, as I said, he's on one of NASA's advisory committees. We always like to have some kind of local impact when we go to a city. Uh, we travel around the country. Our meetings are never in the same place twice, at least not twice in a row. So uh, one of the things we do is we bring local school kids in. Um, give them a, uh, a lecture by a prominent astronomer who does something that they can relate to, such as exoplanet research or uh, studying black holes or something else that kids have heard of. Uh, in this case, it was Emily Levesque, who's at the University of Washington, so she was uh, local and obviously was going to be at the meeting. So she gave a talk uh, to the kids. They're mostly middle school and high school. And then the, we turn the kids loose in the exhibit hall where they get to interact with real astronomers and uh, learn about instrumentation, forthcoming space missions, and so on. So here on the upper left, they're learning about the James Webb Space Telescope uh, with a scale model there. And on the right, they're learning about uh, the electromagnetic spectrum and how uh, light consists of many different wavelengths, many different colors, and that it goes beyond the visible spectrum into the radio, which is where uh, the booth that they're at now is the National Radio Astronomy Observatory. Surveys tell us that the single, well, the single most important reason people come to the meeting is to share science, but the second most popular reason they come is to meet with their colleagues and discuss possible collaborations, make progress on joint research projects, and so on. So there's lots and lots of time in the schedule where people are just hanging out, talking with each other. Um, and so uh, even, even though there's now technology available to make it possible to have virtual meetings like we're kind of doing right now, uh, people tell us they, they don't want us to have virtual AAS meetings. They want to come and meet people in person and have this opportunity to have an exchange of ideas. But as I said, the number one reason is the science. So at a meeting 
the size of the one in Seattle where we had more than 3,000 participants. And that's not, and that's already uh, accounting for the fact that we lost a couple hundred because of the shutdown. Uh, we had more than 2,000 science presentations. Uh, some of them are lectures. Um, the plenary lectures, as I said, are from prominent astronomers who've done particularly important work uh, or from AAS prize winners. Again, they're winning their prizes for important work. Uh, this is Greg Laughlin. He's a researcher at Yale University and he's been very involved in uh, solar system dynamics and exoplanet research. You see there's a picture uh, behind him uh, of the flyby target of New Horizons right on the new year. That's uh, Ultima Thule. And uh, he's showing Oumuamua, the interstellar visitor, uh, to scale there as a little tiny dot. Um, now, everybody was uh, interested in Greg's opinion as to whether uh, some of the speculation about whether Oumuamua was a natural object or whether it might be some kind of interstellar spacecraft. Um, they were curious what he thought. Um, and it was obvious by the end of the lecture what he thought because he never brought up uh, the possibility that it might be anything other than just a natural body. This is Vicki Calagera. She's one of the leading scientists on the Laser Interferometer Gravitational Wave Observatory, or LIGO project. Uh, she was giving a prize lecture on uh, all the recent progress that's been made in gravitational wave astronomy over the last couple of years since the first detection, which was uh, announced in 2016 and made in 2015. As most of you probably know, uh, we're on the hunt for dark matter. It, it makes up most of the matter in the universe. This is uh, Elena Aprile from, she's originally Italian. She's now at Columbia University. And she's the principal investigator on a very large project that is attempting uh, with a big tank of liquid xenon very far underground to detect the rare but predicted interactions of dark matter particles with ordinary matter. And an interesting announcement was made before her talk. Uh, people were asked, or she, she asked the society not to record her talk, and she asked people not to take any pictures of her slides. So everybody was very excited, thinking that she might make some kind of unveiling of new data that suggested that you know, they had found something, that they'd actually measured a dark matter particle. Uh, but nothing like that came out during the talk. Uh, so in the end, everybody just decided she must have just not wanted anybody to uh, steal any of her slides. In addition to the talks, um, and in fact, uh, far more numerous than the talks, are the posters. Uh, so in the exhibit hall, there are rows and rows and rows of one meter square posters where people have summarized their work um, in the form of, of a poster. Or, as we now have, as you can see at lower right, we now also have digital posters. They're called eye posters. What's great about those is that you can stand next to the poster um, and you can run um, videos, animations, simulations, and so on. So the poster you know, comes to life and you can, see, um, you can see things that are best presented in a dynamic format like you would have during an oral presentation, but they're displayed in a poster session where the posters are available all day long. Um, you know, if you, if you miss somebody's five minute oral presentation, you've missed it. If they're giving a poster, you have the opportunity uh, to look at it throughout the week. Um, so eye posters have become very popular. So in addition to all the scientists who come, and uh, of course the scientists are, uh, there are many from universities, many from observatories, from NASA, although in this case, actual NASA employees weren't able to come because of the shutdown. Um, we also invite the media. So here's a photograph in the press room. You see me in the background. Um, let's see, do you, yeah. So, um, so if any of you read Space News, this is Jeff Faust. Uh, let's see, she's hidden behind my video windows, but this is Allison Klesman from Astronomy Magazine over here. And let's see, Alan Boyle, formerly of MSNBC. He's now at GeekWire. This is Clara Moskowitz from Scientific American. Adam Mann from uh, Space.com. So we get uh, a lot of uh, big name journalists who come uh, to cover the meeting. And most of the rest of this presentation is gonna be about the press program. 
and I'll explain why in a second. All right, so I'm a firm believer. Uh, you know, you've heard the proverb: if you uh, if you give a man a fish, he eats for a day. But if you teach a man to fish, he eats for a lifetime. Um, same applies to women, of course. Uh, so I, I'm a firm believer in that. I like to show you how to find information because I don't have time in this presentation to give you as much information as you probably would like to have. So I'm gonna tell you how to find more. And I'm gonna tell you up front. So if you go to aas.org, which is our website, uh, there's always a prominent link to the next meeting. And if you click on that link, you go to the meeting main page and it has a big logo on it like this one. And if you scroll down the page, you can see there's a link to press information. And that is where you can find uh, the whole schedule for, uh, for what is coming in press conferences and so on. Now, uh, here's, if you click on that link, here's the press conference schedule topic and speakers. Now, why is that interesting? Well, as a press officer, my job is to organize the press conferences at the meetings. We typically have two a day, uh, every day in the meeting. Now, how I do that is um, I look at, well, everybody who's gonna give a talk, whether it's a, an oral presentation or a poster presentation, uh, they all submit an abstract. And so we get the abstracts a few months before the meeting, and I look through them, uh, trying to decide you know, which of these presentations uh, is likely to be particularly interesting and newsworthy. I also ask, my counterparts at various observatories, university astronomy departments, NASA centers, and so on, uh, to canvas the abstracts from people at their institution uh, to see if they identify anything that looks particularly interesting. Um, it's important for me to have public information officers, press officers like myself working at these places to, uh, to coach their presenters so that the press conferences are really good and also to write up a press release to go with the presentation, uh, which will often have much more information than the presenter can give in a short talk at a press conference. So if you look for a AAS meeting page and find the press information and go to the press conference schedule, you can see what I and my counterparts have collectively decided is the most exciting stuff to be presented at the meeting, which means you can predict what topics are gonna to be in the news during and after the meeting. So if you wanna impress your friends, you can say, hey, there's gonna be big news on black holes or there's gonna be a big exoplanet unveiling or something like that next week. And they'll say, well, how do you know that? And you'll say, well, you know, I'm connected to the world of astronomy. I know people in high places and, you know, I've, I'm able to make that prediction. So this is how you find that information. So this is what a press conference typically looks like. You see me on the left there. I'm introducing a panel. We typically have somewhere between three and five presenters at each briefing. And we have a room full of reporters and coworkers and other interested people. We try to encourage uh, undergraduates especially to come to press conferences because the presentations are by design um, aimed at uh, an audience of more lay people rather than you know uh, scientists who know everything already. Uh, so press conferences are often the most understandable presentations. And as I said, they also represent the hottest results that we think are going to be presented at the meeting. Usually we're right. Usually, uh, it's very rare that we get blindsided that some other talk or poster uh, that we didn't identify as newsworthy uh, ends up getting any press coverage. So this is a, a title slide from a press conference. You'll see uh, a number of these as I go through. Um, I'm just gonna show you uh, what the titles of the, uh, the topics of the press conferences were and what the, top, the titles of the presentations were. And I want you to, to look at the pictures of the presenters too, because I want you to recognize um, that it's a very diverse group. That is, astronomy is not just a bunch of, um, you know, old white men in white lab coats. Uh, and you'll see that's very obvious as you see the pictures of the presenters. So uh, our first press conference was on uh, some new results from SOFIA, that's NASA's Airborne Observatory. Another um, 
another effect of the shutdown was that Sophia was actually going to fly to, to Seattle and they were going to have tours every day during the meeting of this giant 747 with a huge telescope looking out a hole in its side. Uh, but they weren't able to do that because of the government shutdown. Uh, the pilots are NASA employees and they couldn't fly the telescope. So you can see we had uh, a number of results on exoplanets here, including planets discovered by citizen scientists. Here's the panel. So we had five presenters. Again, mix of old and young, male and female. I'm not going to go into any detail in, in that briefing because I just don't have enough time. Um, I did want to say a little bit about the uh, NASA's new planet hunter, the Transiting Exoplanet Survey Satellite. Um, so we had a status report on the mission by George Ricker, who is the principal investigator, um, and some, uh, some of the early results. This mission is a follow-on to the Kepler mission, which everybody's heard about because Kepler blew open the field of exoplanets by finding thousands of them. Um, here's the panel. George Ricker is the second from the left. Um, so he's at MIT, as are uh, the other, uh, the two people on the right. MIT is one of the headquarters of the mission. Um, George is the principal investigator, the guy in charge. And he's very happy here, as is everybody else, because their telescope, which was just launched early, uh, early last year, um, is performing flawlessly as it does an all-sky survey of nearby stars. The big orange cloud that you see there is an expected distribution of planets around stars. The distance on the bottom, you'll see, it's a logarithmic scale. Um, so TESS is going to find a lot of planets around nearby stars, and many of those planets are going to be roughly Earth size or super Earth size, whereas most of the Kepler stuff, which is the blue, was much, much farther away. Uh, and so the great thing about TESS is we're going to be able to look up in the sky, identify a whole bunch of naked eye stars that have exoplanets around them, and amateur astronomers will be able to measure the properties of some of these planets just from you know, using CCD cameras on modest sized telescopes. All right, let's see, there we go. So um, this is the Kepler field, um, and they've announced just three discoveries so far. Uh, sorry, you know, the test field, I, I think I said Kepler, I meant TESS. Uh, so they've got three exoplanets so far. Uh, here's one. It's um, uh, around a very low mass star. Uh, the planet mass is not known yet. They can tell that the planet uh, is crossing in front of the star. They see a little dip in the star's brightness, um, but they don't know the mass until they get some spectroscopic observations uh, to see how, how much that planet tugs on the star. Here comes another one, I think. Whoop. I missed one. Well, I'm just going to go ahead. One always has to worry when there's animation. Here's another one. This one, uh, 23 Earth masses around a star that's very much like the sun. And there's some evidence of an Earth-sized planet. Uh, they'll have more information as TESS continues to study that field, that region. Um, and with any luck, ground-based follow-up will demonstrate that there's actually an Earth-sized second planet around that star. And that's pretty significant because the star itself is, is very similar to the sun. All right, we had uh, actually had quite a few press conferences on exoplanet results because, as I think you know, exoplanets is now one of the hottest areas in astronomy. Uh, we had so many exoplanet-related presentations at this meeting that we had three parallel tracks going at the same time and our attendees were not terribly happy about that because it meant that if they were in exoplanets uh, they could only attend one of three talks at, at any one time uh, whereas they might have wanted to hear two or all three uh, but there were so many talks that we had to do that there's just not enough time in the schedule uh, so here we have um, uh, I think the most significant result at this um, at this briefing was the one from Elizabeth Bailey, uh, hot Jupiter period mass distribution as a signature of in situ formation. Elizabeth is uh, at center here. Um, hot Jupiters were the first exoplanets found around normal stars. These are 
Jupiter-sized or bigger planets that are orbiting at distances like that of Mercury or even closer to their star. Uh, and it was immediately thought that those couldn't possibly have formed there because it's so hot. How could you accumulate all that gas on a planet so close to a hot star? Um, but Elizabeth uh, has actually done a lot of simulations of planet formation uh, close by to stars, and she's discovered that uh, if the rate of accumulation of, of rocky material and gaseous material um, is, is just right, uh, you can actually form hot Jupiters around um, around bright stars. So, uh, so the jury is still out as to whether those planets had to form farther out and work their way in a process called migration, or whether they some of them at least might have actually formed in place. Almost every year, we have a press conference from the Sloan Digital Sky Survey team. Uh, this is the first digital sky survey. It was started about 15 years ago, and it's still going strong. Um, they have, uh, they've done like four or five different versions of, of the Sloan Digital Sky Survey, um, targeting different things. So right now, they're getting to the point where uh, they're able to, to uh, do spectroscopy of, of millions of stars, um, and they're discovering... Um, you know, the actual chemical abundances of, of different galaxies and all kinds of things. It's really, it's quite remarkable. Um, and they have also just opened up a southern telescope so that whereas it used to be just a northern survey, uh, they're now doing, uh, they're surveying basically the entire sky uh, and measuring the spectra of millions of stars, which is uh, quite phenomenal and something that didn't used to be possible. So here's the Sloan team. All right, one of the uh, most highly anticipated press conferences at this meeting was this one, things that go bump in the night sky. Um, because of the first result that you see there, early science from CHIME. CHIME is a new radio telescope. It's the Canadian Hydrogen Intensity Mapping Experiment. Um, it's uh, in Penticton, British Columbia. Here's the team. Uh, Vicki Caspi is uh, one of the principals involved in that. She's at left. Um, and this is the telescope itself. Um, I actually have friends in Penticton, and so at the end of the meeting, I flew up there, uh, and I had an opportunity to visit Chime. It didn't look like this, though. They'd had a massive snowstorm a couple days earlier, and it was, uh, everything was white. Uh, but it's a telescope that's monitoring the sky um, all the time, day and night, and listening for, among other things, these things called fast radio bursts, which have only been discovered in the last decade. Um, they're kind of like gamma ray bursts in that they happen all over the sky and they ha happen randomly and they're over almost as soon as they start. Um, and like gamma ray bursts in, in the 1970s, we have very little idea what they actually are. Uh, the results from CHIME are very impressive because all the radio telescopes in the world up to this point had discovered maybe 20 or so, two dozen of these things. Uh, CHIME which is still not fully operational, but has only been turned on for about a month, has already nearly doubled that number. And the most important thing that they, just, that they announced at this meeting was that they've discovered only the second fast radio burster that repeats. The first fast radio burster that repeats was unique, and it was found, um, because it kept going off, uh, other radio telescopes were able to localize it. CHIME has such a big field of view that it, it can only tell you approximately where something occurs, but it can't pin it down. But with much bigger radio telescopes, they were able to localize this repeater to a, to a dwarf galaxy uh, a couple hundred million light years away. Uh, and although they still don't know exactly what the source is uh, of the burst, they at least know where it occurred. And now that we found a second repeater, well, it was only announced at the meeting, so nobody had a, had a chance to follow it up yet. But you can be sure that right now, even as I'm talking, there are radio telescopes pointed in the general direction that CHIME found uh, trying to, to localize this second burster. And as CHIME finds more of these repeaters, they're going to be able to finally figure out, well, what exactly is doing the bursting here? In the case of gamma ray burst, it's either uh, colliding neutron stars, as we discovered with LIGO, or uh, very powerful supernovae, but we don't really know what's going on 
uh, yet with the fast radio bursters. Black holes used to be one of the most popular topics of press conferences at AAAS meetings. Uh, now exoplanets has eclipsed that, uh, but we still almost always have something about black holes. And in this case, uh, one of the most interesting presentations was by Dirij Pasham from MIT. Um, his paper was published in Science uh, the same day as the press conference. Uh, he's the second from the left. Um, here again, you see a fair amount of diversity um, in terms of age, gender, race, etc., which I'm very happy. And I, I should say, I don't deliberately set out to do this. It's just that our field is becoming sufficiently diverse that uh, just by luck of the draw, we get panels that are this diverse. And so I'm, I'm happy about that. So Pasham found uh, a very powerful X-ray outburst from a, uh, from a source that was known to have a black hole in it. Um, and the X-rays uh, are presumably, because of the way they flicker, they're uh, clearly emitted very close to the black hole. So they're encoding information about uh, the environment in this black hole. And black holes uh, really can be characterized by just uh, a few parameters. Uh, and when you get x-rays coming from, a, from the environment of a black hole, they're going to be telling you something about the black hole's mass, the spin of the black hole, and how far away the source is from the center of the black hole. And what they discovered in this case was a very, very bright flare from a galaxy that's nearly 300 million light years away, but it was periodic. The signal was periodic. And when they looked at all the ways you could generate a periodic signal, they figured out that they must be essentially seeing X-rays from very, very close to the event horizon of the black hole, and that this spin period, or that this period of 130 seconds um, is the rotation or the orbit of the particles around the black hole, and based on the size and mass of the black hole, uh, that tells them that these particles are moving uh, about half the speed of light, maybe even 70% the speed of light. So that's pretty neat. And it's telling us something about the black hole spin, but what it's telling us exactly, they don't know yet. Um, but there's uh, some way to disentangle the mass and the spin and the period of the, uh, the X-ray variation to figure out how fast uh, the black hole itself is spinning. This is an artist's conception. So what happened was, um, a, the burst came from uh, a star getting too close to the black hole and being ripped apart by tidal forces, the intense gravitational tidal forces of the black hole, and that's what caused the flare, and it's this material going around uh, as it's being devoured by the, back, by the black hole that gave it the, gave the 130 second period. All right, more exoplanet stuff. Uh, there were two very newsworthy results in this briefing. Um, the first from the two guys on the left, uh, Thane Curry and Olivier Guillon, um, and the one on the right, um, Ed Guinan from Villanova. Uh, so I'm going to very quickly just go through a couple of things. So the Subaru telescope at left is Japan's entry into the eight meter class telescopes that's on Mauna Kea. And, uh, They've developed a camera and spectrograph uh, that are essentially the third generation of instruments that are designed to image exoplanets around host stars. Now, you've often heard the analogy that an exoplanet around a star, uh, that trying to see an exoplanet around a star is like trying to see a firefly right next to a searchlight. So these cameras uh, have what's called a coronagraph that blocks the light of the star and allows you to see uh, the space right around the star that would normally just be burned out by glare. Um, so this slide summarizes the progress that's been made over the last 20 years. Um, at first, the, uh, they would very crudely block the star, and nobody actually could see any uh, exoplanets when doing that. But when you add adaptive optics, which counteracts the blurring of the atmosphere to the coronagraph, uh, suddenly you can start to pick out exoplanets. You can be sure they're exoplanets and not background stars because they orbit around the star uh, as you take pictures over time. And at lower right 
is the image of this uh, system HR8799, which is very well known because it has four exoplanets that have been directly imaged. But now you can not only image them, but you can very cleanly separate them, um, not only from the star, but from each other. And because this particular instrument not only images them, but also takes spectra, you can begin to characterize the planets, even if they don't transit in front of their stars, such that the starlight gets filtered through their atmosphere. So here's a case, uh, Kappa Andromedae, where a planet has been imaged directly, you can see it at upper left, and there's a spectrum that was taken by the same system using adaptive optics and the coronagraph that allows you to see water absorption and CO absorption in the atmosphere of this planet, even though it's not transiting. So as these kind of systems continue to be developed, we're going to be able to characterize exoplanets in great detail. And TESS is very important to this because TESS is going to find planets around nearby stars where um, it'll be easier to separate the stars from the planets and everything will be, and the planets will be much brighter than they would be around a more distant target, enabling spectroscopy to be done more efficiently. And then Ed Guinan uh, gave us some interesting food for thought about the star or the star uh, Barnard star and the planet that was announced just last year, uh, which they're calling Barnard B. Um, it's a red dwarf star, so it's, um, it's much fainter and smaller than the sun. Uh, the planet is thought to be a few Earth masses. Um, if you've been uh, paying attention to the discussion about habitability, uh, you may have heard that you know, the habitable zone around a red dwarf star is much closer to the star than the habitable zone around a sun-like star because the star is much fainter. And red dwarfs are often very active. And so there's been concern that their uh, persistent flaring uh, would essentially sterilize any planets that would otherwise be in the zone where liquid water might occur on their surface. So Ed Guinan and his students um, did a very detailed study of this star um, and the planet based on what they've been able to discern about it. And they figured out that uh, in many respects, it's living in a, uh, a more benign environment than Earth is. And it's certainly a more benign environment than the star that's uh, Proxima Centauri, the nearest star to Earth, which also has a planet going around it and is also a red dwarf. And so what they've done is they figured out that, uh, that at least at the surface, um, the planet, if the planet were uh, to host life, it wouldn't be subjected to such uh, high energy radiation that it would kill the life. But can you have um, a habitable zone, or can you have habitability on a planet that's temperature is very, very cold, as this one must be given its distance from, uh, from the star? And the answer is, well, it could have, if it had geothermal energy, which Earth does, of course, um, and Venus and Mercury, they all have hot cores, um, if you had sufficient geothermal energy, you could end up with a subsurface ocean like around, um, like Io, um, not Io, sorry, Europa, um, and potentially Titan, potentially Enceladus, some of the moons of the outer planets. These are thought now to have subsurface oceans of liquid water. You could have an environment like that um, on Barnard B, and you wouldn't have so much high en energy radiation coming from above. Uh, that it would sterilize any life in the ocean. So the idea here is that you could actually have a habitable uh, planet. Uh, the problem is, of course, uh, confirming that it's habitable, and that's the next big uh, frontier in astronomy, or at least in exoplanet astronomy. So the last press conference was astronomers have a cow. Um, they did really get very excited um, because they've found a uh, a transient event, a star that suddenly, or an object that suddenly brightened dramatically. And they wanted, uh, at first everybody thought it was a supernova, but then uh, the more they looked at it, the more confused they became because it didn't behave like an ordinary supernova. So this is the team uh, that was reporting. Uh, again, they were publishing um, this time in Nature. We arranged to have the Nature paper published coincident with the press conference. Um, and so this team, uh, described how they've identified this uh, very strange object that was uh, 
a, like a supernova, but extremely luminous. Uh, it rose and fell much more quickly than an ordinary supernova. And uh, it stayed, uh, it had a central engine that was, that was glowing for weeks, um, which is unusual. Usually, you know, it goes off and what's glowing is the, uh, is the material around the star that died. So they came up with two possible explanations. One is that it's uh, an energetic star or an energetic uh, jet that uh, came out of an exploding star that's colliding with previous ejecta. So basically a supernova where uh, you have energy being poured out of the central engine into the gas that's been previously ejected by the star, or another one of these tidal disruption events where you have a star get too close to a black hole. In this case, it wouldn't be a stellar mass black hole. In order to have the properties that are observed, it would have to be a black hole that was thousands, uh, maybe tens of thousands of solar masses. And that particular kind of black hole has not been detected directly before. So we had presentations that suggested it could be one or the other. And what I liked about this was that it showed not just, it, some people could cynically say, well, it showed that scientists don't, you know, they don't agree with each other. They're not able to get a good result here. They don't know what they're looking at. Um, but that's not really what's going on here. Um, what they're doing is showing you how the process of science works. You get a discovery. Um, it's unusual, which of course is exciting. Um, and you try to figure out what's going on. And, you know, this thing only popped off in June of 2018, and it, it's now basically uh, faded. Um, so they've got as much data as they could get. Uh, in fact, they got data from almost every instrument uh, on the planet and orbiting the planet. Um, and there are competing uh, theories about what it could be, and they're working on trying to sort out which it is. Uh, that's the way things work. Eventually, uh, they may not ever figure out exactly what this one was because, again, it's faded now and they can't look at it anymore. But uh, now that they know that this particular kind of transient exists, they're going to look for more. And with all the surveys that are being done, um, ground-based as well as space-based surveys for things that pop off and disappear quickly, um, they're going to find a lot of them, I'm sure. Now, the reason it's called cow is because all variable objects get assigned a, um, an alphanumeric code when they're first discovered. This one just happened to come out with the code including COW, uh, which spells cow. So, uh, so they call it the cow. And it's the first time at a press conference that we ever uh, rang a cowbell. All right, now I showed you this slide earlier. This was a list of the press conference, uh, the first press conference. Um, by the, this is what, the, what it looks like on the website uh, at the beginning of the meeting. But by the end of the meeting, if you go to the same page, the press kit page, and look at the list, now you'll see that everything is links. Um, I link from each press conference presentation title to the presentation file, the PowerPoint or the keynote or whatever it was. I link to the press releases that may have been issued by the, uh, by the scientist institution. And so if you go to that press information page for AAS 233, which is our Seattle meeting, and you... Uh, click on the press kit, you'll get to this page and you'll be able to click on these links and see each of the presentation files if you're interested in, in learning more. Also, I wanted to mention that we webcast our press conferences because there's a fair number of journalists who don't have funding to come to the meeting. So if you go to that press information page and click on that link, you come up to the press conference webcast page and you don't have to have a password to watch the webcast, at least not most of the time. There are occasions where I have to password protect the webcast, but mostly the only thing that's password protected is the Q&A. And that's just to keep trolls out of the chat room where we have uh, journalists asking questions. Also, we archive the press conference webcast. So if you're interested in actually watching and listening to and seeing the slides from all eight of the press conferences at the Seattle meeting, just click on that link and go to this archived webcast page. If you click on any of the titles of the press conferences, 
up comes a video where you can see the entire briefing from start to finish. I also wanted to mention before we leave that um, the American Astronomical Society now welcomes educators as well as amateur astronomers into the membership of the AAAS. The um, most relevant category for most of you, I think, would be amateur affiliate. Uh, that's primarily for amateur astronomers who are um, you know, try actually doing some science with their equipment, uh, but you don't have to be. Um, but if you're uh, just interested in you know, being a member and, and getting access to the, uh, to the member newsletters and the, and the science news that, that we send out, um, and you might want to come to some of the meetings, you can uh, obviously members get a much better rate at, to, to attend the meetings than non-members. Uh, but if you're doing primarily outreach as opposed to uh, research, um, and I know since you're uh, mostly members of the Night Sky Network, uh, if you're doing outreach, you might want to uh, consider becoming an educator affiliate, uh, which is another option, although the amateur affiliate price is cheaper, so that might be the better way to go. Our next meeting is going to be in St. Louis in June. It'll be a smaller meeting than the Super Bowl of Astronomy. Uh, it'll be like an ordinary game, I guess. Um, and uh, we'll have press conferences there, too, and you'll... Uh, if you go to the AS234 website, you'll be able to see as we get closer to the meeting uh, what the big stories will be coming out of St. Louis. And that's it. One thing that wasn't on my screen as I've been going through this was a clock, so I hope I haven't gone too far over. No, we're doing really good. It's uh, now oh, uh, nine minutes to the hour, so we're, excellent. we're doing great. Excellent. Perfect. So if anyone has any questions uh, for Rick, please type it into the Q&A window. We've got a couple of here, which I think have mainly to do with uh, the availability of uh, the press conferences. And I think we answered them. So Jeffrey asked, are press, press conferences from past AAS annual meetings available for streaming? And I think you answered that. Yep, they go back from as far as we started doing the webcast, which is, uh, I think, five years now. And then, uh, so let's see if we got that. Then uh, were the presentations at the media recorded? If so, are they available to the public? Uh, yep, it looks like they are. I think that's great. Well, let me clarify because okay. uh, we, in addition to the webcasts of the press conferences, we actually do record all of the plenary talks. They are, these are the presentations uh, you know, by the prominent scientists who have been invited to give uh, one hour lectures. Now, those are available to AAS members within a few weeks of the end of the meeting. And six months later, after the next meeting takes place, the previous meeting's plenary talks are available publicly. Uh, the way to find them is to go to the past meeting pages where there will be a link um, to the videos. So the videos from this meeting's plenary talks will be posted behind a member login within the next couple of weeks, but then by June or July, they'll all be available publicly. So would that benefit be, uh, is that available to the amateur members and the educator yeah, if members? You're member, if you're a member and you get a member login, you can, uh, you can see the plenary talks as soon as they're posted. Yep. So that's a pretty good benefit of, uh, it is. It is indeed. of joining. It is. So, yep. Fantastic. Okay, so uh, Bruce asked, what are some of the most interesting articles, presentation that we can pass on to the youth that we encounter at public astronomy events? I think um, based on my own experience, just talking with uh, students and families, uh, you know, people are interested in this stuff that, uh, that's easy to follow, like exoplanet research, right? Uh, we're looking for other planets like Earth around stars like the sun, possible abodes of life. So that always seems to be of interest to people. And then uh, the crazy, sexy, far out stuff like black holes, dark matter, dark energy. You know, what's the fate of the universe? Are we all going to fall into a black hole? Is the universe going to die a cold death? Um, so things that involve big picture questions and uh, kind of flights of fancy, I think. Um, but the one that's the, uh, 
you know, that, that seems to be asked by everybody when they find out you're an astronomer is, you know, do you think there's life elsewhere? And, and that question is driving a really big chunk of astronomy research in the 21st century. Okay, so William asked a question here, and I'm going to kind of expand this a little bit. He specifically was asking, what's the best way to buy a meteorite and know that it's legitimate? Uh, I think that, uh, you know, maybe we could expand this and say, so you hear some something that somebody is claiming astronomically, uh, what's the best way to know that that's a legitimate, um, you know, piece of research? Okay, and I know that yeah. you deal with that a lot. Yeah, that's right. I, in fact, um, whenever you you have a, a public contact info, uh, you hear from members of the public who think they've discovered something. Um, and I often send people to the IAU Minor Planet Center, which is sort of a repository of all things transient happening in the sky, the latest supernova discoveries, latest asteroid discoveries, comets, etc. Um, if you don't see anything else about what you think you've discovered at the Minor Planet Center, there's a pretty good chance that, uh, well, I mean, on the one hand, maybe you've actually discovered something, but it's more likely um, since, uh, since there's lots and lots of people looking at the sky every night, uh, you're just misinterpreting something. You know, maybe you saw a bright planet that you just didn't recognize or you saw something else. Uh, it's hard to say, um, but um, for things like meteorites, um, you know, it's very easy to be fooled uh, into thinking that that uh, an unusual rock might be a meteorite. The best way to know that you're getting something that's really a meteorite, if you actually want to spend money on it, uh, is to buy from a reputable dealer. And these are the people who advertise in magazines like Sky and Telescope and Astronomy. Um, if you just go online to eBay and you know buy a meteorite from some third-party seller, chances are you, you're going to end up wasting your money on a meteor wrong. And uh, I could put in a plug for our, uh, um, in one of our toolkits, the Space Rocks Toolkit, which many of the clubs have, we have uh, meteorite or meteor wrong. Um, mm -hmm. And that's an activity in there. And we will actually be featuring that uh, toolkit in an upcoming toolkit webinar. Mm -hmm. right. um, we're running real close here. I don't know we want to protect your time and get done here, and so we're going to make this the last question of the evening. Ron asked, uh, uh, you've attended many AAS meetings. From your personal experience, do any of these stand out as extra special, special guest speaker, paper, or announcement? Mm -hmm. What are the highlights of your career? Yeah, I think um, it's interesting because I've been attending meetings uh, not just since I started working for the AAS 10 years ago, but also when I was at Sky and Telescope, I used to go as press uh, and sit in on the press conferences and you know wander around and look for good stories. So uh, there were three there were three instances uh, where that really stand out. Uh, the first was in 1989 when. John Mather, who subsequently went on to win a Nobel Prize, projected uh, the cosmic background explorer spectrum of the cosmic microwave background. And it was a perfect fit to a black body. And the entire audience rose in near unison in a standing ovation because it was such a monumental piece of work to show that the cosmic background really did have the spectrum of a black body. In the, in the couple of years leading up to it, a number of ground-based experiments had hinted that there were some deviations from a pure black body. Those were all found to be spurious. Another one was in 1998, when uh, the discovery of cosmic acceleration was announced. The reaction was the opposite. Um, it was such a shock that the expansion of the universe was accelerating rather than slowing, that people kind of sat there in stunned silence. And then the third was, I think, oh yeah, this would have been 1994, um, when astronaut Jeff Hoffman, who is himself an astronomer, 
came to our meeting to describe having fixed Hubble after it was discovered to have had optical problems. And he got a standing ovation too, because he had basically saved NASA and saved the Hubble Space Tel Telescope program for this very audience, the people at the AAS meeting who have subsequently gone on to use that telescope for nearly 30 years uh, to produce all kinds of wonderful science. All right, well, thank you very much for the reminiscing. Those are certainly some uh, uh, high points, I think, for the entire astronomical community and, and it must have been really special to have been there for those announcements. Definitely. So, yeah, I've, thank I've you. It's some great history. It's been a lot of fun. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, Rick. This is, uh, you know, thank you for joining us. We, you know, we're grateful that you're out there uh, doing the hard work to bring all of these wonderful uh, discoveries to the public in an understandable way. And so, thank you uh, for your continuing work. And we look forward to many more opportunities in the future. Well, thanks so much for inviting me. It was a real pleasure to be here this evening. All right. And that's all for tonight. You will can find this webinar along with many others on the Next Sky Network website in the Outreach Resources section. Each webinar's page also features additional resources and activities. We will post tonight's presentation on the Night Sky Network YouTube channel in the next few days. So.